It's the Adam Ragusea Podcast, episode 40, and I guess we have to talk about gas stoves and whether they actually present a significant indoor air quality hazard. Actually, what we really need to talk about is how grievously the COVID pandemic has wounded our ability to have reasonable public discussions about public health issues, or really to talk about anything remotely contentious. The executive summary of my thoughts on the topic are as follows. There's decades of research indicating that gas stoves are at least a little bad for indoor air quality compared to the alternatives. A gas stove, especially in like a cramped apartment with poor ventilation, it may be an asthma trigger for some people, especially kids. And maybe, maybe gas stoves cause some amount of cognitive impairment in kids who grow up around them. And maybe, maybe they increase some cancer risk. The science is not settled. But this also isn't just one study that suddenly came out of nowhere. There's dozens and dozens of published papers on this topic going back 50 years with somewhat varying conclusions. If you're worried about the potential hazards of a gas stove, if you're like me and you have both a gas stove and little kids, most experts I see talking about this say the same basic thing, which is before you spend money replacing your stove, spend money improving your ventilation and or your air purification systems. Cooking on any kind of stove is not good for indoor air quality. And if there's anything the last few years have taught us, it's that better indoor ventilation and air purification is probably good for human health for many, many reasons. If you can, get a better hood and get a HEPA filter for the kitchen. I will also say that the gas stove discourse of the last week indicates how greatly everybody needs to Calm the F down. Left, right, center, we all need to calm our tits. Or our balls. Calm your tits or your balls, as the case may be. Balls are generally jumpier anyway, are they not? We all have to stop assuming worst intentions on the part of everyone else. We gotta stop going from zero to nuclear on every point of disagreement. We got to stop getting mad at science for telling us things that we don't want to hear. And we got to stop getting mad at science when it changes its mind. Because that's what good science does in response to new and different evidence. Also, we got to stop worshiping science unquestioningly, which I know is my vice. I know I do that, and it's not good. Science beats religion, I think. But that doesn't mean science is God. <laughs> Nothing and no one is infallible or incorruptible. Science is as imperfect as the human beings who perform it. Garbage studies do get published all the time in reputable journals. And remember that a scientific conclusion is an empirical observation about the world. It is not a policy prescription. Two intelligent, conscientious people can absorb and accept the same scientific conclusion and come to radically different conclusions about what we should do with that information. Just because somebody comes to a practical conclusion that you disagree with does not necessarily mean they are denying science. May us all calm our tits slash balls. Thus endeth the executive summary. People outside the United States might be wondering, hey, what is he even talking about? Well, I'll tell you. A member of the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission named Richard Trumka Jr. gave an interview to the news organization Bloomberg that was published last week. Bloomberg is a paywalled news site, and while I fully support the rights of journalists to get paid— this incident is a terrific example of the societal hazard that paywalls present. 
millions of Americans lost their minds about an article that most of them couldn't even read if they wanted to because paywall. And thus, a lot of crucial context got lost. Though, let's be real, not many people actually read the full article, even when they can. Still, it does concern me that real news orgs are behind paywalls, while bullshit news orgs are the opposite of paywalled. They often pay to force their bullshit clickbait in front of your eyeballs. This is an enormous and probably unsolvable problem. Commissioner Trumka said of gas stoves, quote, This is a hidden hazard. Any option is on the table. Products that can't be made safe can be banned. Who is this guy? And what power does he have to ban gas stoves? Well, he is the son of Richard Trumka Sr., a longtime national-level labor union leader here in the United States. And being that there is historically a close association between labor unions and the Democratic Party in the United States, Trumpka Sr. was an influential person in high-level Democratic circles. Though he did serve on a commission in the Republican Trump administration, briefly, before resigning in protest, Trumka Jr. is that labor leader's son. And so one can reasonably presume that that's at least partially how Trumka Jr. ascended the political ladder to his current position on the Consumer Product Safety Commission, which is a regulatory body appointed by the president, in this case, President Biden. Trumka is one of five members on the Consumer Product Safety Commission, and he is not the chair. He is not the boss. As evidence of his relative lack of authority and influence here, Trumka actually tried to do something about gas stoves a few months ago at a meeting of the Consumer Product Safety Commission in October. He offered an amendment that would basically start the ball rolling on the commission regulating gas stoves in some way, a proposal far short of anything like a ban. And even that got zero support from his four fellow commissioners. It was dead on arrival. Trumka Jr. seems to have gotten out over his skis on this one. Very quickly last week, both the commission chair and the White House itself put out statements saying basically, whoa, 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 whoa. We are not planning to ban gas stoves. We're concerned about what the science is telling us. We're looking at options, but... Trumka Jr. got out over his skis. And even then, I think there is a reading of Trumka's original remark that is both charitable to him and likely accurate. When he said ban, he probably didn't mean what lots of people envision, which is federal agents come into your home to confiscate your stove and leave you with a giant fine or a court summons or something. The commission probably wouldn't even have the authority to do anything like that, and that's not how U.S. regulatory bodies generally handle a situation like this. What they usually do is make rules that gradually phase out a certain class of products found to be particularly harmful. And the way you do that is you ban them going forward. Like every existing gas stove would be grandfathered in. You would just stop the stove industry from making and selling new ones. Or maybe you'd only let them sell better ones that better manage emissions. Or maybe you would do something like make a rule that says no gas stoves going forward in any newly constructed, federally subsidized public housing units. Oh, Brits, that means council estates. Colloquially, we would call them projects here in the U.S. Government-built or government-subsidized housing for poor people who can't afford housing on the private market. The government could say, okay, no more gas stoves in any new public housing that we build. That sounds like a potentially sensible public policy to me. Poor kids are way disproportionately affected by asthma. 
air quality is a particular problem in the kinds of small apartments that poor people generally live in, at least in cities. And if you're going to live in government housing, I think you expect to submit to the government's rules up to a reasonable point. Poor people deserve liberty too, obviously. Banning gas stoves in any new public housing is one thing that the government could do that's well short of sending men in sunglasses and flak jackets over to your McMansion to rip out your $10,000 Viking range, Karen. Something a little more aggressive would be banning gas stoves in new multifamily housing, apartment buildings. We generally regulate apartment buildings a little more heavily than we regulate detached single-family homes, for totally logical reasons. Again, there's reason to think air quality is a bigger problem in highly dense housing. Also, multifamily housing is more likely to be rental housing, and renters have basically zero power over what kinds of appliances are in their homes. In practice, it's going to be whatever the landlord chooses, and we're generally more comfortable regulating landlords than we are regulating owner-occupiers, for totally logical reasons, so... Banning gas stoves in future apartment buildings seems like maybe a logical step to take. But this is just me spitballing here. These are just examples of some conceivable things the government could do, short of an outright ban. The kind of ban that lots of people are freaking out about right now. And the actual people in the actual U.S. federal government have simply said, we're aware of the science, it's concerning, we're looking into it, but we are not contemplating a ban. On the state level, it is different. It is different in California, as so many things are in California. Starting this year, 2023, the state of California is gradually phasing out gas stoves along with all other gas appliances like furnaces and clothes dryers. It's not an outright ban there either. As of 2023, the state simply says that anyone building a new home in California has to build the electrical panels and the circuitry necessary to support all electric appliances. The actual California ban on new gas appliances doesn't go into effect until 2030. And even then, it will only apply to new construction or to like older buildings undergoing significant renovation. This is basically how we institute most building codes in this country, like with the Americans with Disabilities Act. They didn't say that every public building has to be wheelchair accessible. That would be impractical. They just said every new public building has to be wheelchair accessible, along with any building that you are gut remodeling basically. Why is California going so hard on gas stoves? Well, there's all kinds of like political reasons for that, but there is a practical reason too, which is that California gets a lot of earthquakes and residential gas lines pose a particular hazard during earthquakes. The lines break, gas leaks out, it inevitably ignites on something and boom. Now, up-to-date gas lines contain emergency shutoff valves designed for exactly such a scenario, and I don't know enough to know whether such emergency valves render this entire concern moot. I'm just saying that California has unique factors to consider when it comes to regulating residential gas appliances. Of course, they have other problems in California. California is among the U.S. states that has been particularly struggling to meet electrical power demands during heat waves, for example. Electrically powered stoves don't work when the power is out. That's a temporary inconvenience in the case of like a rolling blackout instituted to conserve power. We had rolling blackouts here in East Tennessee when we got that crazy cold snap right before Christmas. I was doing prep work on Christmas dinner when the power went out for 15 minutes. Thank God the roast wasn't in the oven yet. It was crazy cold outside. Everybody was running their electrical heating really hard. And the Tennessee Valley Authority didn't have enough juice for everyone. So they cut off our power for 15 minutes every two hours that day. Not great, but not a catastrophe. 
The thing is, real catastrophes tend to result in much longer power outages. Blizzards, hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, and yes, earthquakes can knock down power lines and damage substations or even the generating stations. In a really big disaster, it can take weeks or months to get the power back on for everybody. And that's not great when you have an electric stove. You can't cook. And more importantly, you can't boil water. The same kinds of disasters tend to damage water pipes and water treatment facilities, and tap water can become tainted with pathogens. In that event, local authorities issue a boil order, meaning any tap water for human consumption should be brought to a boil first to kill any germs. If you don't do that, you risk getting dysentery or some other Oregon Trail disease that you never hear about anymore until a major disaster hits. So what's better for a disaster? An electrical stove that could stop working? Or a gas stove that could explode? Trying to make good public policy that balances all of these risks is really hard. And I personally think that we should all cut some slack to the people charged with doing so, to say nothing of the air quality risks associated with gas appliances, and what are those exactly? Well, natural gas and related fuels are, for all of their flaws, incredibly clean burning relative to other fossil fuels. That's why we use them inside our homes. Try cooking over burning wood inside your kitchen sometime. You will immediately fill the room with smoke, and you will run out onto the street coughing, if you're lucky. If you're not lucky, you'll just pass out in your kitchen and die. Back when we mostly cooked over wood fires, we either did it outside, or we did it in fireplaces with chimneys that direct the smoke outside. Say you level up to coal or charcoal. Coal is a rock that's mostly just carbon. Charcoal is wood that has been burned in a low oxygen environment until what's left is mostly just carbon. When pure carbon burns completely, that is, in the presence of sufficient oxygen for complete combustion, all that's left is carbon dioxide and water. Too much carbon dioxide in the air you're breathing is bad, potentially very, very bad, but it's not nearly as bad as carbon monoxide, which results from incomplete combustion and is incredibly toxic. Carbon dioxide is also not as bad as many products of combusting things that aren't carbon. The problem with coal and charcoal is that, in practice, they aren't pure carbon. They're just mostly carbon. The best coal for burning at home is the kind that's closest to being pure carbon, and there's a lot of variation there. When we bought our new house here in Knoxville, it came with some major basement flooding issues. Thanks to you and to my valued sponsors, I could afford to install a sump pump system. Thank you very much for that. It's a finished basement with a drywall and carpet and stuff. I am recording from the basement right now. Carpet below me, acoustical ceiling tile above me, perfect conditions for pod or radio. But anyway, because it's a finished basement, there's sheetrock drywall on top of the actual walls of the concrete foundation. So they had to knock out a bunch of drywall to access the foundation in order to install the sump pump. And when they knocked out one of the walls, there was a door. I have fantasized my whole life about a moment like this, going into an old house and finding some forgotten passageway to a secret place. I was beside myself with excitement when I saw this hidden door behind a wall in my basement. I tore away some more of the sheetrock, I swung the door open, and beyond there was... our coal room. We have a coal room. It's under our porch. 
It is a surprisingly large concrete lined basin. So back in the day, a coal truck driver would have made regular deliveries to the house. A guy like my grandfather, Grandpa Ragusia, was a coal delivery man in New York. He apparently had like next level skill at backing his truck into like scary, narrow residential alleyways in cramped tenement neighborhoods. A guy like that would have backed his truck up to the porch of my house here in Knoxville. He would have opened an iron trap door on the side of the porch, and he would have poured coal down a chute into the coal storage room below. And that guy probably would have died of lung disease some years later, like Grandpa Ragusia did, because coal and cigarettes. Anyway... I went into this little coal room that I didn't know we had, and there was still a bunch of coal left on the floor. I picked it up, and it was clearly anthracite, the best, most expensive coal. It's like dragon glass. It's super shiny, super brittle. It is the best coal because it's the coal that's closest to being pure carbon. So it burns really hot and clean. Not much smoke or soot compared to the alternatives of the day. Clearly, fancy people lived in this house. The neighborhood has gone to hell these days, obviously. I mean, they're letting riffraff like me in, but a riffraff like me can do all kinds of fancy people things these days, like investing in fine art with Masterworks, sponsor of this episode. When you're trying to invest money in your family's future, as I am, diversification is key, especially in turbulent times. RIA reports 88% of surveyed advisors intend to increase allocations to alternatives over the next two years, with over half raising allocations all the way to 15%. One alternative has seen amazing numbers, even in the really rough market year that was 2022, and that is fine art. 2022 was the best auction year ever, with the highest total from big three auction houses being nearly $18 billion. I'm obviously not talking about nonsense NFTs or whatever. I'm talking about actual art with actual aesthetic and historical value. Picassos, Banksy's, etc. The problem with investing in those is that they cost tens of millions of dollars. I do not have tens of millions of dollars. This is where Masterworks comes in. They've been written about in Forbes, Business Insider, and the Financial Times, etc. They buy paintings that they think are likely to appreciate in value. They register the painting as a security with the SEC, and they break it down into shares. You can buy a share, and when the painting resells, you get a slice of the potential profits. Masterworks' last three exits have delivered 17, 21, and 33% net returns, and they had five exits in 2022 alone. Masterworks has nearly 600,000 members, and paintings have sold out in minutes, but you can get priority access at masterworks.art slash ragusia. Masterworks.art slash ragusia. Past performance is no guarantee of future success, of course, but check out Masterworks and see if it's the right diversification option for you. Thank you, Masterworks. Anyway, back when they only let fancy people up in this neighborhood, they heated this house with anthracite coal, and they probably heated the stove with anthracite. But even the best, most expensive coal is not pure carbon, and it makes a fair bit of smoke that you have to direct up a chimney or a flue if you don't want to cough and choke and die, or if you don't want a layer of soot building up on every surface in the kitchen. They absolutely did have natural gas back when this house was built, but it was only used for street lamps downtown. Natural gas was originally a byproduct of oil drilling. They'd pump the oil up and Hydrocarbon gases, predominantly methane, would bubble out of the solution. The oil would kind of boil once relieved of the incredible pressure of being locked deep inside the earth. These gases that would come out were initially regarded as a hazard because all you need is some part of the oil derrick to spark and then boom. So drillers would channel the gas up some kind of pipe They would light the end of the pipe and simply burn the gas off, safely away from everyone's faces. Eventually, someone got the bright idea of channeling that gas into tanks so that you could use it for something somewhere else. 
The original killer app for gas was City Streetlights, called Gaslights. Little did they know that 150 years later, Gaslight would come to mean... Any kind of deception, I guess? People have absurdly broadened that term in recent years. Gaslighting was originally an elaborate con to trick someone into believing that they're insane. Because Gaslight was the name of an old movie where a guy does exactly that to Ingrid Bergman. All of a sudden now, any kind of deception is gaslighting. I don't know. I guess you could legitimately broaden it to mean any kind of deception that causes someone to doubt themselves. Sorry if I gaslit you just then. Anyway, gaslights. Gaslights worked for downtown streetlights because you don't need to install a lot of pipeline for that. In a traditional downtown, you got thousands of people living in a very small area, so it's just not that many miles of pipeline to lay. To run a gas line out to like a rural house would have been ridiculous and kind of unnecessary because wood smoke isn't such a big deal in the country where you're the only house around. When you're in a big building with a dozen other families all burning fires, yeah, smoke becomes a big problem. But eventually they started running gas lines out to the original inner ring suburbs of cities, like the one that I live in. Gas line infrastructure really expanded in the mid 20th century here in the United States. And the gas company very quickly put the coal man out of business. Grandpa Ragusia had it tough. He was an ice delivery man until refrigerators put him out of business. And then he started driving a coal truck and then natural gas. Natural gas was simply way better than coal. For one thing, no burly, soot-covered guy had to deliver it to you. Gas just flows to your house like water in the pipes. You don't need a giant bin under your porch in which to store gas. You don't have to make regular trips down to the bin to fetch some coal anytime you want to make something hot. Gas just flows directly into your furnace or your stove, where it burns cleaner than anything. Good natural gas is virtually pure hydrocarbon, so there's almost no particulate matter coming up as smoke. And as gas appliances got more sophisticated, they got more efficient. A modern gas fireplace combusts the gas so completely that you might not even need any kind of vent. No chimney, no flue. There's so little carbon dioxide left that it's safe enough to just flow into your house. Carbon dioxide is not toxic the way that carbon monoxide is. The only direct danger with carbon dioxide is if there's so much of it that it crowds out all the oxygen in the atmosphere such that you just don't get enough to breathe. But Google ventless gas fireplaces and you'll see what I'm talking about. With a super efficient burner, you just don't need a vent. At least when you're not burning that much gas. A largely decorative small gas fireplace simply doesn't burn that much gas compared to a real gas furnace. And a stovetop requires way less gas than a furnace. There is no need for ventilation when burning natural gas on a modern stovetop. Or at least that's what everybody thought. Because nobody was sent coughing and hacking out into the street by a gas-burning stovetop. Gas posed no acute danger. Actually, there was one acute hazard of natural gas, which is that if you leave the line open and a bunch of gas accumulates in your house, then boom. That's actually pretty easy to do because good natural gas has no smell at all. You want to hear the saddest story ever? It's 1937, the city of New London, Texas, a little town that grew up rapidly around an oil field. They needed a school for the kids of all of the oil workers, so they built one, and they heated it with gas piped directly from the oil field. And then one day there was a leak that filled up a crawl space that ran under the entire length of the school. You could not have built a better bomb if you'd tried. And yeah, boom, about 300 people dead, mostly kids. The news was heard around the world. 
the Chancellor of Germany sent a telegram with his sympathies, a gentleman by the name of Czech's notes, a Hitler. A number of very bad ideas were coming out of Germany at the time. But here's a good idea that came out of Germany, odorizing natural gas. You add sulfur compounds that give it a rotten egg smell, and that way at least people know when a room is filling up with flammable gas. But that was the only acute hazard posed by domestic gas-burning appliances. Gradually, scientists started to wonder if there were any chronic hazards, things that you would never notice on the individual level, but harms that might accumulate over years and years of exposure and maybe only affect some fraction of the people who are exposed. And so we have 50 years of studies looking into that. It's not just the one that came out in December that everyone is talking about right now. Go on Google Scholar, search gas stove health. You're going to see dozens and dozens of papers. And here's some of what they've explored. A well-functioning gas stove does not make a lot of carbon monoxide, but it makes a little, and chronic exposure to small amounts of carbon monoxide over time is thought to aggravate cardiovascular disease. Gas stoves never shut off all the way. There's always a tiny amount of uncombusted gas leaking out into your kitchen. You breathe it in, and one particular hazard there may be benzene, Natural gas is mostly methane, but there's some other hydrocarbons in there as well, including benzene. And benzene is a known carcinogen. Airborne exposure to benzene elevates your risk of leukemia. Nobody knows for sure if gas stoves put enough benzene into your kitchen to significantly elevate your cancer risk. Some studies say maybe, yes, but it would depend on a ton of factors. And then there is NOx. The extremely hot combustion happening within the blue flame of a natural gas burner results in nitrogen oxides. NO and NO2 are formed when the flame basically burns the atmosphere in your kitchen, which is, of course, about 78% nitrogen. Vehicles with internal combustion engines do this as well, but you don't normally leave the truck running inside your kitchen where your kids are eating their breakfast. Now, because a gas stove is a relatively small thing that burns relatively little gas and makes relatively little heat, it doesn't make a ton of NO and NO2, but it makes a little, and especially in a little kitchen or in a kitchen with no ventilation hood over the stove or in a kitchen with a crappy ventilation hood over the stove, man, I've had some awful ones that did basically nothing. Or there was the one at our old house in Macon that one day I discovered simply vented straight up into the attic. In a kitchen like that, people could end up breathing in a fair bit of nitrogen oxides over time. Early childhood exposure to NO2 is linked with impaired cognitive development in kids, and it is linked to asthma. Does it cause asthma? Or does it exacerbate asthma? Maybe either, maybe both. It is not an open and shut scientific case. Says me, no, I'm not a scientist. You shouldn't care what I think about such things. I'm just telling you what the experts say. Lots of them are worried about this, but almost none of them talk about this risk as a certainty with overwhelming, devastating consequences. Perhaps that is why this latest study got so much attention. Last month, December 2022, published in an open access journal, we get population attributable fraction of gas stoves and childhood asthma in the United States. It is a meta-analysis of other previous studies. I've seen lots of people reacting to this study saying meta-analysis isn't real science, Bullshit. Meta-analysis is awesome. It's how you get the big picture. On the other hand, it is also notoriously easy to perform meta-analyses that cherry-pick only the studies that support your hypothesis. The authors analyzed previous observational studies on childhood asthma risk factors, and they determined that 
almost 13% of current childhood asthma in the U.S. can be attributed to gas stoves. That's perhaps a more dramatic finding than a lot of previous studies have come up with. And go on Twitter right now and you will find lots of experts poking holes in their statistical analyses. I do not have the expertise to scrutinize either the analysis or the counterarguments. I do know how to look people up and see whether they have affiliations with the fossil fuel industry, and a lot of the people poking holes in this meta-analysis are quite obviously in bed with the fossil fuel industry in one way or another. The natural gas industry is scared. They see the writing on the wall. They know people are worried about gas safety, and they know people are worried about global warming. Burning natural gas results in greenhouse gas emissions, like any other fossil fuel does, but natural gas extraction also creates a lot of greenhouse gas emissions because some of the gas gets out and rises into the atmosphere, and uncombusted natural gases have very powerful greenhouse effects. And we're not just getting gas out of the oil wells anymore. It's not just an inevitable byproduct of crude oil extraction. We are mining deposits that are specifically natural gas deposits. And a lot of it gets out in the extraction. So the gas industry has been on a well-documented, right there out in the open, public relations campaign to hype the virtues of gas stoves. Not because gas cooking is the most important part of the gas business. It's not. Most gas is burned for home heating and for electricity generation. But not many people really care what gets burned for fuel down at their local power plant. Not many people really care whether they have a gas furnace at home or if they have electric heat. In contrast, lots of people feel really strongly about their stoves. I don't need to tell you that if you listen to the Adam Ragusea podcast. Food and cooking is as dear to people as religion, and gas stoves really are better for cooking in many ways compared to electric stoves, at least old electric stoves. Old electric resistance coil stoves were terrible. You turn them on, they take 10 minutes to heat up, and if you get it too hot, you turn the heat down, it takes forever to actually cool down. Gas, in contrast, is responsive. It gets hot immediately, it cools down immediately, the only lag is in the transmission of the heat through your pan. Looking at the social media discourse on this potential ban on gas stoves that isn't actually a ban, man, there are a lot of people who still have not heard the good news about contemporary electric stove options. There are electric stoves on the market now that kick the ass of gas stoves. I've referenced it many times before, but there's a Consumer Reports review of stoves from a couple of years ago where they tested how long it takes to bring a pot of water to a boil, and none of the gas stoves came out anywhere close to being on top. Good, modern electric stoves are more powerful. I used to cook with electric back at our old house. I had an incredibly beefy electric stove that I said was resistance coil, and someone in the comments of one of my videos pointed out, rightly, that it, is a, it was a hybrid stove. It used electrical resistance, but it also used infrared waves to heat the pan. That's very common in glass-topped stoves in the United States these days. And it's a great combination, super powerful, but it's still not super responsive. It still takes some time to heat up and cool down and the glass surface gets extremely hot and stays extremely hot for a while. Until the day I die, I will still have the scream ringing in my ears from when my boy put his hand on the hot glass stove and got a small third-degree burn. For months after that, I got a feeling of dread when I walked into that kitchen, which made my then new job as a food YouTuber, particularly stressful at times. Then we moved to this house, which has a gas stove. It's great in some ways, but I really miss the power of electric. Whenever this stove breaks, 
we'll replace it, and we'll replace it with induction. Induction stoves are electrical stoves that heat pans with magnetic fields. Induction stoves are super popular in Europe. They're starting to catch on here in the States. Induction is more powerful than gas. It's almost as responsive as gas. And the stove heats the pan, not itself. The hot pan, in turn, transfers some of that heat to the glass that's on top of the stove, but the stove itself doesn't get nearly as hot as on conventional electric stoves, and it cools down a lot quicker. The risk of anybody burning themselves is a lot lower. Also, induction is way more energy efficient. Indeed, I'm quite convinced induction is the future. Induction is awesome. It's expensive, but the cost will probably come down as more people adopt it. Induction stoves don't work with all pans, only pans to which a magnet will stick, i.e. anything with iron or steel. But the only common material that rules out is 100% aluminum pans, which are generally terrible anyway. Lots of people on the internet haven't gotten the memo yet. Lots of people still think that gas is the only choice of serious cooks, and that simply isn't true anymore. Pros are starting to switch to induction. But an expensive Viking gas range remains one of the ultimate domestic status symbols, and the natural gas industry is real happy about that. They want to keep that going, and so they've got their Now You're Cooking With Gas PR campaign you may have seen. If the industry can keep the moneyed classes in love with their gas stoves, then at least some of those rich and powerful people will resist the decarbonization movement that seeks to replace nearly all fossil fuel-powered appliances and vehicles with electrical ones, even if the electricity comes from a power plant where they're burning natural gas or coal or oil. This is not hypocrisy. There is a legitimate reason to advocate electrically powered things, even if the electricity that's in the grid comes from a power plant that burns fossil fuels. The grid can change. The car or the stove cannot. If heat generation or force generation is distributed across millions of individual gas-powered vehicles and appliances, that's millions of individual things that have to be retired and replaced if we can ever figure out a way to power our lives sufficiently with renewable energy. A more centralized system is easier to transition to renewables, and that transition is inevitable because fossil fuels are finite and will run out at some point. I have no idea if decarbonization of vehicles and appliances is the right long-term strategy to help shift us to renewables, but it is a coherent strategy. It makes sense on its face. Lots of people poking holes in this latest meta-analysis have obvious ties to the fossil fuel industry. I don't know if their criticisms are valid, but I know to be suspicious of their motives. I also know how to look at the affiliations of the authors of said study. Conveniently, they put their affiliations right in the paper, and they list any conflicts of interest they may have, because that's one of the best things about scientific literature. Looking at the authors of this paper, you've got some of your standard academics, a professor in Australia, a professor in New York, and then you've got two authors from the Rocky Mountain Institute, which is a nonprofit organization focused on lowering carbon emissions to address anthropogenic climate change. Rather than describing itself as a think tank, the Rocky Mountain Institute calls itself a think and do tank. And one of the things they do is retrofit buildings to be all electric. I know all of that just by looking at the paper and then going to the website of the organizational affiliation listed by two of the authors. No one can say they hid who they were 
or where they were coming from. But it is interesting that in the conflicts of interest section of this paper, quote, the authors declare no conflict of interest. If you work for an organization that renovates the gas infrastructure out of buildings, that seems like a potential conflict of interest when you're researching reasons for which people might want to renovate the gas infrastructure out of buildings. That doesn't look good. On the other hand, if we reject all the science done by people who have a particular interest in said science, there would be almost no science. People investigate the things they care about. Ultimately, it is an ad hominem fallacy for me to dismiss someone's argument on the basis that they work for a fossil fuel industry group or on the basis that they work for an anti-fossil fuel industry group. The proof is in the pudding. Is the research good and are the conclusions sound? I'm not expert enough to tell you either way. What I can tell you is this latest meta-analysis is hardly the first piece of research to raise concerns about gas stoves. There are dozens of papers out there, most of them concluding that gas stoves probably have at least some negative health effects on people. But some of the papers conclude they might not. I can also tell you that cooking on any kind of stove introduces all kinds of volatile organic compounds and microparticles and such into the air. And these things are not great for us to be breathing in all the time. So ventilation is good. HEPA filters are good, no matter what kind of stove you have. Open the doors or the windows when you can. Save up for a better range hood. For God's sake, do not replace your perfectly good gas stove in order to help stop global warming. I said this a year ago in a video that I did about the problems with gas stoves in which I mentioned a lot of this research about indoor air quality. I'm not totally sure, but I think we can reasonably guess that the carbon footprint of replacing a perfectly good stove with a new one is a lot bigger than just using the gas stove until it dies and then replacing it with induction or something better. Contrary to what lots of angry people on the internet will tell you right now, it is not hypocritical to be concerned about gas stoves while simultaneously having a gas stove. I have a gas stove because it came with this house. That's why most people have the appliances they have. The appliances were already there. I'm concerned about gas stoves. There's enough research to make me think they're probably more risk than they're worth. I'm probably going to replace it with induction at some point, but not until it starts to peter out on its own. Until then, I will remind myself to turn on my downdraft, even when I'm not cooking something particularly smoky or smelly. I'll try to build that habit so that I can keep doing it when I eventually get an induction stove, because any kind of cooking introduces stuff into the air that's probably bad for us to be breathing frequently over many years. So always run your blower when cooking. I'm also going to try to not round up the evidence to proof. There's evidence that gas stoves might be meaningfully worse for human health than other kinds of stoves. I'm going to try really hard to not round that up to gas stoves are definitely killing poor kids, and anyone who wants to preserve access to gas stoves is either a science denier or a sociopath. Scientific debate is good. More science gets us incrementally closer to the truth. There are confounding profit motives on both sides of this particular debate. I will say, I think the profit motive for perpetuating reliance on fossil fuels is considerably more powerful than the profit motive for transitioning away from fossil fuels. Generally speaking, I think it is a false equivalence when people say, oh, these environmentalists are just grifters. They're just trying to raise money from donors or get the government to pay them to do things. Sure. Those less noble motives do exist in that world, but I am less worried about that because there's just way less money in it. The fossil fuel industry 
in contrast, represents the greatest concentration of wealth in the history of wealth. Plus, all our comfortable lifestyles depend on fossil fuels. We have every incentive to make ourselves believe that fossil fuels are fine, even if they're not. There is simply way more money and inertia on the pro-fossil fuels side, so I am more skeptical of arguments originating from that side. But I'm also skeptical of the competing arguments, if not for the profit motive, then for the almost religious orthodoxy that has calcified around certain particularly contentious issues among the self-identified pro-science crowd, which includes me. Really, the stove thing is just a quaint little microcosmic replay of the COVID thing. COVID hit the scene. Scientists got real worried about it and started to say things like, hey, we need to institute some social distancing policies to keep too many people from getting this virus too quickly. We need time to figure out what it is and how to treat it. You got to flatten the curve, etc. The scientists came bearing bad news, and lots of people just didn't want to hear it. Here in the U.S., they didn't want anything to endanger the bullish stock market we had going. They wanted to kill the messenger instead. They made all kinds of specious, unscientific counter-arguments about how the virus didn't actually exist, or it wasn't actually that bad, or it could be easily treated with certain drugs already on the market, etc. Those of us in the self-identified pro-science crowd reacted by going orthodox and adopting the prevailing scientific view of the moment as incontrovertible fact. We dug in, which isn't great. Good science flows from an open mind. Also, if you recognize that COVID is real and really bad, it does not necessarily follow that we should respond by shutting down public accommodations and schools. It is a perfectly rational position to say, the virus is real, way more of us are going to get it if we keep going to bars and going to schools, etc., but shutting down schools could easily do more harm than good. There are competing interests to balance here, including the interests of individual liberty, and so I don't support government-mandated COVID lockdowns. That is not a science-denying argument. And yet people such as myself, who supported COVID precautions, we often branded any dissent as anti-science, simply because some of the dissent was anti-science. Not all of it was. The same exact discourse poisoning happened with global warming. I think there are people who deny the evidence for significant anthropogenic climate change because to accept it would threaten their livelihoods. And I think there are people who deny that evidence simply because they don't want it to be true. And I think these people are primarily at fault for the poisoned discourse on climate change. However, I also think that those of us in the self-identified pro-science crowd are complicit in poisoning that discourse because we dug in and we went orthodox. Yes, the prevailing scientific view is that the net temperature of the planet is rising alarmingly fast and human activity is likely a significant factor. However, the prevailing scientific view gets proven wrong all the time. If new and better evidence comes along that contradicts the current prevailing view, I do have confidence that truth will out in the long term. In the short term, I'm worried about it. You know, if a bunch of really good climate scientists were like, oh man, this new data suggests our climate models were really wrong. The planet is not warming like we thought it would. If that happened, I would worry that 
reputable scientists would be scared to publish that. And if they did, I worry that they would be pilloried by people like me who have dug in in response to irrational or bad faith arguments made by people for whom the current prevailing scientific view is either inconvenient or unflattering. Luckily, it doesn't really matter because there are a dozen reasons to quit fossil fuels as soon as possible. You don't have to believe all of them. Likewise, I'm really not sure if an all-plant diet is more sustainable than eating at least certain kinds of meat, but I've got a dozen other reasons to eat less meat, so I don't need all the reasons to be valid. In the long term, I have confidence that the truth will rise to the top like cream within mainstream scientific discourse, but in the short term, I worry about it. Like, I accept the prevailing scientific view that COVID vaccines do a lot more good than harm. But I could also imagine that maybe new evidence will end up proving that that isn't the case. And I'm worried about the ability of people like me to be open to that possibility, just because there are a bunch of irrational and or bad faith actors demonizing vaccines for spurious reasons. And people like me react to that problem by digging in and going orthodox. COVID and global warming are way more important than stupid gas stoves, but gas stoves are in my wheelhouse, so that's why I just talked about them for an hour. I wanted to get away from controversial topics this week, and I wanted to get back to audience questions, but the whole gas stove thing happened, and I figured, hey, what do I even exist for if not to help you make sense of things like that? I appreciate very much you spending this time with me, regardless of what kind of stove you have. Any questions or comments for a future show can be sent to askadamquestions at gmail.com. If you you want your thing in the show, please do attach an audio or video file of you introducing yourself and delivering your comment or question. I don't know what Thursday's recipe video is going to be yet. I'm back to trying to make a recipe for homemade yeast extract, you know, homemade Marmite, but I don't think I'm going to have it by deadline. Our house is just going to smell like yeast farts until I can crack this code. I still can't work out the right growing medium in which to make the yeast reproduce. I can extract the lysate from them, but I cannot manage to filter out the remaining cell wall debris. It's a whole thing. I probably need to come up with a totally different recipe for Thursday. I always come up with something. Make good choices. Talk to you next time.